Hi, welcome. Welcome to the this edition of Massey Book Launches. I'm Nathalie Derosier and I'm the principal of Massey College. Massey College is built on indigenous land, the land of the Huron Wandat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And we are grateful for the opportunity to continue our work here and to celebrate books. And this was what we're going to do today. Today, uh, we're going to celebrate a great book because Massey is a community of scholars, young and old, for whom writing a book matters. It's a little a bigger task than just writing a Twitter uh, comment. It requires for ideas to be formulated, fully formed, vetted, reflected upon, and eventually read in a full form by others. So we want to celebrate the writing of books. And today we're going to celebrate a great book, a book that's called Wish You Were Here, A Murdered Girl, A Brother's Quest, and The Hunt for a Serial Killer. It's written by John Allure and Patricia Pearson. It's the story of a brother's lifelong search for the truth about his sister's murder and the failure of the police force that was ignoring the cases of missing and murdered women at the time. And eventually uh, the surprise uh, find of a previously undiscovered serial killer. But we'll ask more probing question because this is a book also about what are the risks and the opportunities about investigative journalism, personal investigative journalism, when someone decides to go on a search to try to find answers? It also asks questions about what do we do when institutions fail, like the Sûreté du Québec in this case. This is a book that was particularly touching for me because uh, it's a story of a missing young woman in 1978. I was a young woman in 1978 in Quebec. It could have been me. It could have been any of our of my friends. So it's always a, a with sobering thinking that we look back on the history of failures of institutions. Real people are behind it. So I just want to uh, uh, really uh, welcome, uh, particularly. Uh, Patricia reached out to me to say this would be a good work uh, to discuss with the Massey community. So Patricia Pearson, award-winning journalist, novelist, whose work has earned reputation internationally. She's been, she, her work has appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Times, USA Today, CNN, the BBC. Her first work in nonfiction when she was bad won the Arthur Ellis Award for Nonfiction in 1997. She's also written another book that will be uh, adapted again, uh, A Brief History of Anxiety, Years and Mine, which the New York Times assigned major points for wit and flair and was adapted for television and won the Rocky Award for Best Social Issues Documentary at the Banff, Banff International Television Festival. She is joined in this uh, venture by John Allure, who has worked in victim advocacy since 2002. His uh, website, Who Killed Teresa, is one of the first crime blogs on the internet, and it began an, an investigation and uh, solve the, uh, trying to solve the murder of his sister. He's been involved in victim advocacy. He now is a, is a graduate of Trinity College of the University of Toronto, holds a master in public administration, specializing in justice administration from North Carolina State University. And really, he's worked so hard for so many years to get the Sûreté du Québec to, to start a cold case unit, and they finally did, and thanks to his effort. And he was awarded the Senate of Canada Sesquin Centennial Medal for his work in victims advocacy. It's wonderful to have you. And we are joined today, I think they'll be in a conversation with someone that I think we're so delighted to have. Rick Beanstalk is an acclaimed Emmy Award winning Canadian filmmaker. I, I actually am so excited about this, having you here at Massey. Uh, what a star. 
She has, she's known for investigative documentaries. She's done such fabulous work, you know, from sex trafficking to human organ trade, corruption. Uh, she really goes beyond the scene and really makes us see what we were not allowed to see, uh, but is really a bre breathtaking in, in her endeavors. Her films include The Accountant of Auschwitz, Tales from the Organ Trade, Sex, Clay, sex Slaves, uh, aka The Real Sex Traffic, Ebola, Inside and Outbreak, which we should all see now, Boxing, In and Out of the Ring, Penn and Teller's Magic and Mystery Tour, Mrs. Conceptions, all of them have been screened throughout the world. It's a real honor to have you. She's an officer of the Order of Canada for incredible work to bring to uh, the public stories that needed to be told. I just want to say what an honor it is to have you here. And I'm going to let the Patricia uh, begin by talking a little bit about the work. And I'm so delighted that you've uh, come uh, to Massey College to uh, talk about this great work and what does it mean to be a good investigative journalist. Patricia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Principal. And thank you, Rick, for joining us. And um, hello to John again, my partner in crime and solving crime. Uh, and thank you for everybody who may or may not be out there watching us today. Um, I just want to give you first a sort of quick, I'm working on a bit of an elevator pitch summary of what we've done, and then I'll give you a short reading from it just to give you a flavor so that we can then proceed to some conversation around it with Rick. So this is a book that traces the arc of intertwined lives from when I first walked into John's house as a teenager, the year after his sister was found dead in a creek in Quebec in her bra and underwear, near to her dorm room at Champlain College, a Cégep to his reaching out to me many years later when I'd become a crime journalist to help him investigate. We followed the evidence and shifted the verdict from drug overdose, for which there was no toxicological evidence or history, to sexual murder, and from there we found a pattern of written off and likely linked murders in Quebec and in Calgary so it's a story of that arc across 40 years, and then of what that means about policing, about underestimations of sexual violence, and about the way such traumatic, unwitnessed victimizations shape love and grief. Did I get that right, John? That's pretty good. Okay, thanks. So here I'm just gonna read briefly from uh, from chapter six, when the snow melted. And into this bizarrery, I quietly fell, Edgar Allan Poe. On Saturday, April 14th, 1979, the Allures were in their hometown of Trenton, on a bay of Lake Ontario, having supper with the clan, the aunts and uncles and cousins who all appear smiling and waving in John's father's Christmas home movies from the 60s. The phone rang. John's Aunt Linda beckoned his father to take the receiver. My brother and I were whisked to the basement. I remember standing down there discussing what the call might mean, John said. Then we were told to go with our cousin Paul, who was a bit older. The teens wound up lighting a bonfire at another cousin's house, listening to Van Halen and drinking beer. They stayed up all night. And the next morning, John said, I woke up and watched some sci-fi movie on TV, like Earth versus the Spider. Eventually, they all climbed into Paul's ragtop MG and drove around listening to Steely Dan and Max Webster. Around 3 p.m., John and his brother Andre were dropped off at their grandparents' house. 
It was like a surreal interlude, a dance on the edge of knowing. We walked into the door, past the laundry room, and my grandparents were sitting on the sofa crying. I had never seen them cry. We went into the back bedroom where my parents stay, and they were on the bed, crying. Teresa had been found. She was dead. I walked outside. There were patches of cloud in the sky. For some reason, I had an Instamatic camera, and I started taking pictures of the sky. I wanted to capture the moment I knew she had died. On an impulse, John began running. He left the yard and ran for probably 15 kilometers, the longest run he's ever done in his life. You gotta get some distance between you and the grief or the grief will eat you up. He understands that now. At the time he was 14, it was primal. Run from the walls that are about to fall in, run from the roof collapsing, and then further from the shattering sky. Within 24 hours, the family was in Montreal because Bob had to identify his daughter's body. The four of us drove, but I don't remember talking. What I remember is arriving at the lab and the corridor was green. They were at the Laboratoire de Médecins Légal de Montréal, sorry, in the main headquarters of the Sûreté de Québec on Parthenay Street in the east end of the city. Teresa's former roommate from Point Claire had been summoned to the lab earlier to see if she could make a positive ID. She couldn't. Corporal Goudreau showed niece, showed the roommate, the clothing found in a green garbage bag at the entrance to the Gagnon farm in Compton, where the trapper had encountered what he described as a mannequin. These clothes did not, she said, belong to her friend. A pink fluffy sweater? The clothes were wrong, but so was the body. None of it belonged. Bodies don't just immediately transform from sleeping beauty to Halloween skeleton. There are deeply disconcerting and disorienting visual transformations along the way that add an indefinable element of horror to the emotional devastation felt by families whose loved ones are found as remains. John said, my father walked down that corridor to see the body. He came back out and he was a completely different man. I remember him saying to my mom, Teresa had a scar on her eyebrow, right? And she said, yes, but he couldn't recognize his child. Later that afternoon, Corporal Goudreau, Coroner Michel Durand, and Bob Lore convened at the SQ headquarters. Everyone agreed that the body was almost certainly Teresa's. Goudreau told Bob that despite the decomposition, the autopsy would reveal Teresa's fate. For now, Goudreau was leaning toward a possible suicide or perhaps a drowning or a drug overdose. He assured me that the whole matter may be resolved quickly, Bob wrote in his diary, that she may have been intoxicated by liquor or drugs. Durand mentioned observing bruises under the armpits. What was the explanation for that? Goudreau didn't know, but he doubted that Teresa was the victim of a sexual predator. He pointed out the underwear. If she had been raped, her underwear would have been torn, he explained. The underwear on the body was in pristine condition. You cannot rape a woman without tearing her underwear. You cannot rape a woman using her mouth or her hands. The three men sat around in silent agreement, resting in their ignorance 
of women's experience. And I'll just leave that there. And we can move into conversation. So, so what's the, uh, what was, is it like for John to hear that and re, you know, kind of write that together? That must have been quite, quite the story. Well, it's, it's not a lot of fun <laughs> to, to hear it, quite frankly. Um, but that's, that's what happened. Um, it's quite, un, it's quite uncomfortable to, to listen to. It's probably why um, I would say, uh, you know, a lot of that Patricia wrote based on experience and what I told her. I wasn't going to write that. I'm much more comfortable at uh, the investigative stuff, you know, the, the, the anything that, that's probing into the crime. I'm good. The, the personal stuff, I'm not, I'm not so well equipped to handle that, quite frankly. Even though after all these years, it's still like quite a painful subject to to uh, to discuss. So so eventually, so you went and and became uh, the investigator almost. You know, the ones that should have happened, the investigation that should have happened. Does is that how it felt right for you to do? Yeah, you know, the subject of becoming the uh, the investigators come up, and um, you know, as I would say, that that was an iterative process, right? It wasn't a planned out kind of. This is my five year plan. This is what I'm going to do. It just turned out. It kind of turned out that way by asking a series of questions mm -hmm. and, and probing and not getting satisfactory answers and being told lies. Yeah. So, so then, you you know, there's a period of research on different pockets of things. So you're building up your body of knowledge about certain things. And, uh, you know, I mean, you mentioned me getting my master's. I mean, my master's ostensibly is in is in public administration. It was really in justice administration. Yeah. Now, I didn't tell my employers that, but that's what I was doing. You, yeah. you know, so very, very slowly amassing a body of knowledge. So, uh, so that from the outside, you became with inside information or trying to seek inside information. How does it really work? And, and that has helped you. What, what did you learn, you know, certainly about your, the, your family tragedy, but for general systems, you know, the systems of policing around, what, what was at stake? Why did it go so badly? Yeah, well, this this is the thing is is you know very early on, in in I, I guess my my work as an advocate, you know anybody begins as an advocate from a personal point of view. I mean, even Senator Pierre Boisvenu, who is now Senator Boisvenu, and speaks of victims' rights and all that, and, and understand that Pierre is a dear friend. Pierre started from the position of my daughter Julie has been murdered. Right, and it branched off from there. So my 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 initial my first position was Teresa's murder, but after a while, you know, you get accused of being the squeaky wheel, and and it's sort of like, well, you're just really interested in your own cause. So that's kind of what propelled an interest in other cases, and and sowing that. And so the more I learned about, you know, initially it was three murders in the townships, and then it was ten to twenty to thirty murders. Um, within the Montreal Townships Corridor, uh, all within a period of, say, 1975 to 81. And, and what, they, what they all had in common was, you know, a number of things. Systemic failure of systems, um, poor police investigation, not only just now, now you know, my agency is the Sarté du Québec, but I have brothers and sisters who are victims and they were saying, wait, I had the same experience in Laval. No, wait, I had the same experience, you, you know, in Longueuil. So there was this, and, and the third um, most important component 
was that what we all had in common was the, the destruction of physical evidence in all of these cases, which needs to be in my, you know, that doesn't happen just by accident. That, that points to the possibility of a colluded effort. Mm -hmm. So why don't we uh, bring Eric here about what's like, She's been doing this work uh, all the time, you know, trying to push the limits of trying to uh, go where nobody else has gone, trying to uh, get information about systems that don't want to disclose information. So what, what, what do you say about, you know, particularly the young people here at, at Massey College who are interested in documentaries and interested in pursuing uh, the truth, finding the truth. What What is your advice? It's funny because my first advice is always just don't do it. Uh, <laughs> you're gonna do it, marry well. But that, but I don't think that's what you're looking for uh, in terms of uh, inspirational uh, talk. I mean, it, it's uh, look. There is it, it really is an era of uh, of content now and content that's delivered in many different forms. And one of the things I wanna talk about with uh, Patricia and John is this kind of, uh, it, you know, I, I think Patricia mentioned the term citizen journalist and I hadn't thought about it like that, but, you know, just natural uh, instinct and curiosity, uh, how, how that can bring you to, uh, bring you closer to finding things and just, you know, being a human being and not, and it's so many people who are untrained as, as, uh, as journalists who have been kind of moving into the true crime podcast world. Because if you, if you think about the podcast that, um, on this American life that started it all, which oh, I'm having a blank out on what that was. Um, pardon me? Serial. Yeah, exactly. And it was just, I mean, of course the woman worked in, in radio, but a lot of it was just the plotting, reading, talking to one person, talking to another, following every single little lead going down the roads. And one there's, we discovered that there's an appetite for, understanding that process from a consumer point of view, meaning viewers or listeners or readers, but two, that, that it feels in a way like the, the police or the authorities who are meant to do that work, you suddenly realize all the gaps and how the systems are not necessarily in place uh, uh, to, to solve these problems. They're not necessarily built for that. There's so many interacting uh, areas that you have to you have to work with. From you know, it, I mean, let's get let's get back to the book. If you look at the book, you know, it's Champlain College and it's Cecile de Quebec and it's the Montreal Police and it's her friends and it's and uh, it, you know, you were able to go and start breaking all of that down and speaking to everybody and uncovering and finding through through all of those conversations, getting closer to something that was uh, truthful. No, nobody in the police obviously was willing to put in that time or was motivated to or was tasked with doing it. So I've just gone off on a tangent there, but that's what I find so interesting about the book. Um, and also when you said it, um, I don't know if I'm supposed to call you principal or Natalie. Patricia called you principal, Na so Natalie's I don't want to. fine. <laughs> um, I'm I'm from Montreal, and I was born in '59, and uh, so you know, like you said, that could have been me. And we hitchhiked in those days. Yeah. And I mean, I remember hitchhiking, and we get in, we got into sketchy vehicles sometimes, and. I just hadn't had any uh, contact with the police. So reading the book kind of made me aware of what was going on in, in my own city, you know, not far from me, but I had no awareness at the time. So I found that very compelling to get a real view of the behind the scenes. It is, but it does speak a little bit to, as you say, um, a police force that may not have the resources that 
you know, decides to look the other way, gets thrown into, and I think the book speaks a little bit about that, how they were obsessed with doing other types of investigation and other investi uh, and so so it matters where the resources are spent, which which actually is interesting now that we're thinking about defunding the police. If we read the book with the defunding the police, where do we go? Are we uh, are we stuck in thinking, well, maybe we shouldn't be defunding that function, uh, or what? What do you think? Well, I think and this is something hopefully we can kind of expand on in a conversation with uh, with John and Patricia that their police is partially also a reflection of the time and and the politics and society in that moment. So, and the book does a really good job of painting a picture of the, of the atmosphere. And so you start understanding how um, uh, horrific crime like this could just kind of pass through the cracks without anybody really focusing on it to get a handle on it because, um, you know, if you think about the mores of the time, what I found very interesting with, and and it's not that new, but it's the idea that she must be a drug user, she must be a heavy part, like all of the other steps of the things that she could have been, a prostitute, uh, this and that, that those were the those were the first go-tos. They didn't want to go beyond that. It wasn't, you know, John, you say you're dealing with a murder, but that wasn't their first instinct even. Mm -hmm. And that really is a reflection of the time. And it's important to understand what happened then in the context of that period of time, but also, so how does that relate to us now? I mean, it's not about defunding the police. It's about having the police focus on what's important and also, um, do their jobs, just do their jobs. You know, I'll, I'll just say what was missing here. And I don't really want to get into a defunding police discussion. That's really not what the book is about. But what I will say this uh, about the, the, the police forces then and now, it is and it was always a game of cops and robbers. That's what the Sarté de Quebec, and you can extend the parallel somewhere else, is interested in. They've always been interested in very much men macho crimes taking down the mob, taking down the Hells Angels, les motards, this, this kind of thing. And even if, and if you want to apply it today, um, what's the lead story today? Well, it's that the local police in Montreal have, have gone off the island and they've done a full-scale raid um, to, for this ricin letter that allegedly was sent to the White House. Now, you, there is so much press on that raid and the fact that they got the SWAT teams out and, 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 and the, you know, the focus is on that and on their their paramilitary outfit going out there and cracking heads. It's the RCMP in this case. Now, what no one is mentioning since March, since lockdown, which I have noticed, but no one has brought it up, is the number of young women who have gone missing in Quebec day after day after day. And it just is very, very silent. You see so-and-so has disappeared off the street. Boop. In 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 you name it in Saint Jerome or in in uh, you know in Valley Field I can show you a catalog in the last six months of at least thirty to forty women that have just disappeared and no one is talking about that let alone the police. So do you think it's a media problem that the media gets to validate a certain type of policing and that this sort of Let's go after uh, you know the 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 women, the young women that maybe leave home because it's uncomfortable, or and then maybe go missing because uh, the lockdown created an entire array of uh, violence against women paradigm. Well, uh, what's the, uh, what is is the, is it the media's fault or is it just that the 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 police is feeding the media that? The, what they're good uh, good at. Well, what's happened with the media in the last 20 years certainly hasn't helped the situation. I mean, we're sitting here, Patricia and I, and saying, you know, you should you should you should um, 
you should use these a lot of these big systems with a lot of distrust, um, be it whether it's education, but my apologies to Massey College, um, those institutions or or the police force. And now what we've thrown into the mix is investigative journalism, which practically does not exist anymore, or it's quickly, quickly winnowing away. Once upon a time, the Montreal Gazette, La Presse, had an army of investigative journalists. Montreal Gazette is down now to two. Um, I, I believe Paul Cherry and uh, Jesse Faith are, are the only two left, and they can't cover everything. So that certainly doesn't help, and that certainly is that, you know, my, my playbook 20 years ago was to go to Patricia, who was an investigative journalist, and ask for her help. Nowadays, there's nobody around to offer that, so you have to do it yourself. So, uh, Ricky, what's what do you say when you know, like you, you that's your trade, like you're doing movies about uh, investigations and trying to uncover truths. So what's what are your tools? Is uh, Freedom of Information Acts your tools, or what's how do you continue to 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 continue to work? I mean, well, it's very different beast making documentaries because, and this kind of touches on uh, a little bit on the theme of the danger of sensationalism, because if you're doing a documentary film, you have to raise the money to do it. And in order for, to raise the money to do it, people are looking for something that is important, but also is a good story and is an interesting story. And they want to know that you're going to get access so that people will watch. So it's a fine balance between kind of your own, I mean, most, not everybody, but if you're doing those kind of social issue documentaries, which I tend to do, is you want to do some good. At the same time, you're always, you have to go places that are uncomfortable to get the good story. But, you know, it, it's a very, it's, it's very different. But I agree with John and I've, you know, following Patricia's career that you, I mean, a lot of it is just human it is human curiosity. So sometimes it's freedom of information, but I asked, I mean, you can, uh, John, you can talk about this. I said, where did you get all this information? Uh, and actually, let, let me ask you that now. All this information, even though I know the answer, uh, about, about the, it was a massive amount of research for you to paint a picture, which you did very early on in the book, of the environment, the political and social environment and the police force at the time, which really, um, you know, initially I was reading it and not understanding why so much information. And then I realized you're painting a picture of an environment at the time so that when we look at what happened to your sister and then the other women that you talk about, but largely your sister, that it's not just out of context that you prior to that. And it's, and, um, and I, I want to talk to you about that, but also about to Patricia, because I'm very interested in how you two work together, but let's start with the, with, um, why you opted to do that and how you got that massive amount of research that was done. When I'm reading it as a person who does this, I thought this is not, you know, this, you're not Googling this information. This is a lot of compiling of multiple different things from different sources. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a learn as you go process, right? It, I mean, it started very, very logically and simply by going to the Bishop's library uh, in uh, in Lennoxville, um, which was one of the last places Teresa was allegedly seen, and going to the basement and scanning microfiche of local newspapers. That's really where it st started. And then it evolved into, you know, forming relationships with people at the National Library in Quebec and, 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 and you know, working those relationships over years, uh, getting to know how to, to submit... Uh, you know, a public information request to the coroner's office or that kind of thing, all of which was done, you know, initially in a foreign language, not so much now. I mean, a nice offset of this is my French company. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a very good, uh, you know, side benefit. Um, you know, so th there was there was certainly that and all of it done in another country, by the way, all, of, you know, virtually all of it, the few times that when I, I would venture to, to Canada, but mostly it was done digitally, all of it. And yeah, that was, you know, that was a lot of work. And, um, but it's not just amassing the information. It's, 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 
assessing what the information is telling you. And, and I'll just, I'll give you one very, very small example because I want Patricia to weigh in here. Um, one of the cases we deal with is Manon Duvet, who disappeared and was found murdered about six months before my sister. And uh, she's between 10 and 12 years old, a little bit younger. But uh, the, the, you know, the local authorities had a really hard time wrapping their head around the idea that a girl that age could be the, the victim of a sexual murder. They still have that prob problem. And as an example of that, what I'll give you is uh, on the, her 40th anniversary, which was two years ago, uh, Le Tribune did a big piece, as they do on these anniversary dates, right? They roll out these articles that are really not very, very insightful, and they sort of end with the conclusion of, there for the grace of God go I. And, and that's their conclusion, really, nothing more than that. But in that article, Le Tribune, the reporter, said Manon Dubé had not been sexually assaulted. And that is not true. If you look at the source document, which was in the Tribune 40 years ago, in their own darn paper, what, what the coroner's conclusion was in May of 1978 was that there was no evidence, there was no concrete evidence of sexual assault, which is not the same thing as saying there was no sexual assault. In fact, I was able to obtained the initial coroner's document on that. And the first conclusion he comes to, the coroner, is I think this is a sexual assault. So for me, it's just, it's lazy journalism then and it's lazy journalism today. But is it more than that? Is it also that the gatekeepers, like the coroner's office, like these reports frame the discussion from then on? And, and that we are a little bit at the mercy of these institutions that, you know, in, in 1978 may have thought about uh, sexual assault about women differently than they do now or something. So, so is, that, uh, is that something that you, let, let's bring in Patricia and, and Rick here about how do we challenge institutions that frame the discourse? You know, how do we challenge institutions that in a way uh, define what we should know <laughs> when we say, well, maybe not. Maybe we should. We want to know something different. Well, I think that that was that's a really important question right now. I think we're right now we're in in the midst of a of a quest for um, grabbing the reins of who tells the narrative, um, who gets to be the storyteller on the stories that shape our lives right now, and the interpreter of those stories. And when I went back and helped John and we looked in the, in the late 1970s, it was like entering into this kind of parallel universe of women who'd been articulating over and over again that they were being sexually assaulted in the eastern townships of Quebec leading up to Teresa's disappearance. But none of that narrative was taking hold. So in that, exactly in that case, the, the local police and the SQ were, were holding the narrative to the idea that it that Teresa had to have been deviant, that Menon Dubé had to have been the victim of a hit and run driver, that women were making mountains out of molehills, that they didn't really get raped, that they couldn't get raped if their underwear was intact. So it was really very much around the framing of, of the uh, gendered understanding of what was taking place that enabled so much silence and so much um, pain to go um, completely unprosecuted and uninvestigated. And we're talking about lots of cases. Like I was extremely surprised at how many women came forward just when John and I started to, to look. Well, I mean, I mean, I think this is the story of the missing and murdered indigenous women as well. It, I think, uh, it's it's this uh, under reporting under uh on un, you know the way in which the police didn't think didn't link didn't pay attention and so on so uh what what does it tell you rick about this the, what are the things that we could draw from the book that could make this book really quite relevant to studying policing now well, I, again, I, I, I want to throw this to to Patricia because we had discussed this a little bit. Um, how is 
uh, policing different. Now, you talk a little bit about how they were focused, uh, not focused on human rights, not f focused on, on, so uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was an expect, I think we have, and women have always had an expectation um, that is misplaced, um, that the tradition of policing in North America must somehow arise from a concern with the human rights frame. Whereas, in fact, it has never arisen from that. It has always been about protection of property. Um, John has looked very deeply into the history of policing and how exactly that arose out of the idea of protecting property in England and France in the 19th and 18th centuries. So, so you know, there's never, until we completely reframe our understanding of what police are meant to do and then how they enter into their training around that, um, we will run against this problem over and over, which is that not only are they more attracted to um, a kind of, you know, the, the cops and robbers rather than cops and rapists frame, um, but also they just don't even conceptualize their own role as being one of protecting the vulnerable um, and listening, listening to what it means to be vulnerable. What does that even mean? Um, from the point of view of a citizen as opposed to the, from the point of view of a cop. So I think we've made some gains in the last 40 years, um, for sure, particularly with women on police forces. Um, but, the, but the whole frame needs to be, you can't change it unless you become aware that it's there. So that self-awareness piece has to come into place in terms of policing, I think. They have to see where they came from to understand where they're going instead of just becoming defensive. Well, and, and it's you, it's, go ahead, Rick. Yeah. No, I was gonna say there was something else that I learned and that is um, from the book. And that is that, again, if you look at the time, uh, CSI as a show didn't exist. You know, uh, they wrote that it was like the bionic woman was what was on television at the time. And we, even as viewers and consumers are now so kind of familiar with the forensic and scientific aspects that you still need a positive attitude and you still need the willingness to, to, uh, to research and investigate. But, um, we just didn't think of looking at crime with the same, we didn't have some of those tools and that just wasn't now it's part of a toolkit that is uh, a given with any crime investigation. So I thought that was interesting too. the picture that was painted, uh, you know, of that time really helps you understand the context. But um, there was something else I wanted to ask, and that was you, you went to this um, Comic-Con, uh, uh, Comic-Con, not Comic-Con, Crime-Con, this convention of true crime people you describe in the book of people who are doing podcasts, doing crime writing, but even victims' families who would set up a booth in the hopes that somebody would take an interest in their story so that they would maybe, I mean, their utter desperation where their own police forces obviously weren't helping them. And this reliance on TV producers or bloggers or to do it. Can you describe that and tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I, it, it, this was in Nashville, Tennessee. It's an annual event and it takes place in like a big resort hotel and there's hundreds and hundreds of women who are there as the big true crime fans and all the podcasters are the celebrities um and you know uh nancy grace from you know um, i don't know if she's on cnn now or where she is but like the big tv stars in terms of true crime were there and what you begin to see is this world that's kind of feasting on um sort of Mm, like their their own the, the idea of armchair sleuthing um, that 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 it's a parlor game that there really aren't actual living victims at the heart of these things that that somehow it's a kind of way to engage um, you know that you know better that you can figure it out that you can and that's the enchanted boundary that John had to walk where, where when the institutions fail and you come in and you try to investigate. How do you not become one of those people who is um, thinking they know better, that they can find a better way in, um, and then start to lose perspective again on, on, 
on the on the damage and annihilation that's actually been caused by the violence. So it was fascinating to go to this thing, I have to tell you. And it's also really interesting to me that it's all women who consume this kind of true crime, yet they are the victims of it as well. Well, it's quite the, it's, it's quite the story in a way. I think it, it's both a, a Canadian story, a Quebec story, it's a policing story, it's a terrible story about a, a family's loss, a young woman. Uh, that uh, we uh, continue to hope uh, would be here to just tell her story. Uh, but it's also a, a story about the institutional failures. And I, I wonder about what's the what's the next step? You know, what what would you want readers out of this book to get? What what should we ask uh, our police forces or our our governments to do? once we've read the book. Uh, let's start with you, Patricia. Um, you know, for me, it's just a question of uh, remembering how recently it was, first of all, that, that, that um, women didn't, uh, you know, had very little agency and very little narrative power. Um, we, it, I think we, we're very ahistorical right now in our discourse. Um, and we, it's useful always to remember that it's been very recent in the last several decades that we've even made gains toward people understanding that rape was an actual thing that happened. Um, so for me, it's partly just engaging people in that, in that, um, conversation around how recent some of these gains are and why it's so important to hold on to them and to elaborate on our, on these narratives. Um, and then John has has his own um, very powerful sort of um, insights into into how we could move forward through conversation. John, yes, yeah, I you know I'd, I'd say my feelings about this have evolved over the years. I'm I'm not uh, I don't think it's very productive to have an adversarial relationship with with the police. Trust but verify. You know, in these these matters. Um, for the for the very reason, um, and uh, you know, Rick, for good reason, you confused Comic Con with Crime Con. I think he's <laughs> part for very good reason, and because there's that danger. And you, Natalie, you brought this up: the the idea of to challenge the police, but how much is is too much? And, and the fact is, is that we need the police. I can't solve a crime. I can't bring a crime to justice. That's not that's not my job. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my days of, you know, my 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 goal or an outcome from this book is not for me personally to then demand another justice inquiry, yet another Charbonneau or Poitras, you know, I just I'm not if somebody else wants to use the book as a tool for that, that's fine, but it's it's not going to be me. Um, mm -hmm. There's enough in the book that 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 for, I think for a reader will feel like this isn't answered, mm -hmm. and that's a, that's deliberate in the writing. You yeah. know, Patricia and I like a story that 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 an asks the reader to do some work, mm -hmm. and so there's plenty of room in this book for somebody to pick up the torch in different areas. And run with it, and I I would encourage that type of activism. It's not going to come directly from me, but but I would I would hope that a reader would first of all read the thing, and then really reflect on it, re truly reflect on it, mm -hmm. and what your motives are and and what you want to do next, because I think it has implications for everyone. It's a hard thing to question a justice system. It's a hard thing, man. <laughs> it's not an easy. It's not it's an easy, easy. road. Yeah. You know, I said my, I have a handler at the Certé de Quebec named Sylvain, mm -hmm. and we were talking recently, and we have a good relationship. And he didn't know about the book, and I said so we were talking, and I said, Sylvain, I have good news and I have bad news. He said, oh, Yeah, Mr. Allor, what is it? And I said, Well, I said the bad news is I have a book coming out. And he goes, oh, oh, yeah? 
And I go, yeah. I said, now the good news is, Sylvain, you're not in it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and that's it. And we shared a laugh. And, mm -hmm. and so I do hope that, that, that they will read the book and with their humanity, that, that then we can, as Patricia said, we can start to have a conversation. That's my hope. It's wonderful to have you. Rick, the last word to you. I shouldn't get the last word, but I, I just say generally, I mean, obviously, I think it's a wonderful book and it's moving and it's beautifully written and it mixes a personal story with a story about a police saying so. And it does a beautiful job of interweaving those stories so that the message is universal. Uh, it's not only specific. So, uh, you know, what, one of the things I like to say is everyone should read it, uh, but also you know, even with the, some of the films that I, uh, I've done on sex trafficking or whatever, you always want something because you want to bring it to people's attention. And you can only move the dial uh, a little bit. But some people see it. It moves some people. It makes one person do it. I mean, you know, it's just that's all you can do, right? You're not going to change the world with one book. But it, when you take the time to lay it out and you and you um, you know create something as compelling as this book is, it will move the dial. All it takes is one more person to take to 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 take that torch from you, and then more good work will come out of it. So you know, I think uh, you know it's beautifully done, and I'm uh, I was very honored to be asked to participate in this discussion. Well, merci. Uh, thank you all. I want to say this: the book is the uh, paragraph uh, is is our. Uh, partners in this, so there will be uh, signed copies of the book that can be uh, obtained for the Paragraph uh, uh, booksellers in Montreal. You should read it and and continue to reflect on it. So thank you very much, John, uh, Laura, uh, Patricia Pearson, and Riggs Beanstalk. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for a really good and in-depth discussion about a good book to read. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Rick. Mm -hmm.